it will yield a mass amount of burning, it will yield a mass amount of hurting, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's effective, nor does it mean you should do it. tell you now, I'm already uncertain about the hat. I spent 10 minutes trying to figure out if I put it on properly. I looked at pictures. I can't figure it out. It's all a bit of a shambles, but you're going to have to wait to see how bad it really is. Today's a video, obviously, and we're going to talk about some things. We're going to talk about Caroline, last name I'm not going to pronounce because about at least three people in the comment section are going to laugh at me for doing so, so I'm not even going to give you the satisfaction. We're looking at her successive circuits workout. You're thinking, Harry, circuit training. What's new here? Dumbbell leg workout, Epic End Game Day 31. There's a reason we're looking at this workout in particular because a few people actually did send it to me because there's a few things I want to address. And we, the way we're going to go about doing so is like this. I'm going to go through some of the workout, not all of it, because it's 47 minutes long. That's a long time. We're going to spend more time focusing on more of the technical things of her movements, as well as covering quite a big and I, I think important topic and subject, which very much relates to the title. Before we do so, a few things must be done. If you do like the video, please let me know you like the video by dropping a like on the video. 1200 likes in the first 24 hours is the goal. So if we could hit that, that'd be bloody splendid. I would very much appreciate it. If you haven't already, please do consider clicking the red button down below and subscribing to the channel and maybe even the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week, twice a week. We are tickling, I mean tickling, 50,000 subscribers, which in all honesty is bloody tremendous. I don't think the reality of like how much this YouTube channel and like now as a whole has grown has really set in. Even at the start of the year, I said to myself, you know what, if we could reach 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year, that'd be amazing. We're in March and we're tickling it, which again, I, I can't thank you enough. Honestly, genuinely means the world to me and literally adore each and every one of you. On top of that, if you have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video, drop it down below for comment question of the week and I shall do so. Now it is hat time. The picture told me it's meant to look like this, but I think in shipping it's been bent because now it goes, like this. It's a shambles. This is not what's going on. The picture didn't look like this. This is better. It's a bit, it's a bit tight. I can't do it up. Help me, please. I just want to look pretty. That's bloody tight. I don't feel very pretty in this, okay? I don't feel, that's too tight. I can't breathe. I'm fragile. Very strong Velcro. Really impressive. I like that. Now I'm looking like Little Bo Peep. Time to do some stuff. So what this is, is obviously just a circuit workout. She goes through, I think, about 13 different exercises. The subject of the title of the video is somewhere hidden in this. That's all I'm going to say, it's somewhere hidden in this. We'll skip the beginning bit because it kind of talks about like formalities, what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, stuff like that. It's things that we like to see, but things that you don't necessarily need to see here. Throughout the video, we're going to go through a few movements in particular, which Caroline performs, that I would like to give some input on for a few reasons. And they're also movements that I think a lot of people in general, maybe you at home, may struggle with or may perform incorrectly. So I just want to kind of give you some tips and tricks before we then get to the main source of the video, which I'm going to make you wait for. So first of all, we've got a squat, rear lunge, switch side, RDL. Okay, so the reason why we're gonna tickle, tickle this, you know that personally I'm not a big fan of combo movements, but they, again, that very much comes into the realm of muscle building. When looking at like, optimizing building muscle, I don't think combo movements really have much of a place. The reason why I can understand their involvement, because this workout is not solely designed for the purpose of building muscle. Caroline is very much known for her home workouts and for how good her home workouts are. She is one of the more popular and bigger content creators of the home workout and home fitness scene, which is fantastic. And sometimes I often have to remind myself, those who do choose to do these workouts are not necessarily looking to build as much muscle as possible from these workouts. They're looking at building a bit of muscle, which sure you can achieve, provided you are doing the things that need to be done. So obviously progressively overloading things along those lines. But they're also looking at burning calories, moving a lot, improving their fitness, a lot of other things. It's not just building muscle. So I'm, I'm trying to take myself out of that mindset. And remember that your goals aren't necessarily the same as my goals. So for that reason, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about combo movements because I think for the caloric expenditure side of things, they're obviously burning more calories and moving more. They obviously have more of a place than they would if you were just looking at building muscle. The big first movement we're going to talk about today is going to be the RDL. And the reason why I'm bringing the RDL up is because a lot of people, maybe even you at home, often say to me, Harry, when I do the RDL, I feel this in far more in my lower back than I do in my hamstrings and my glutes. And we're going to talk about why that might be occurring. The RDL is one of my favorite movements for the posterior chain, specifically the hamstrings and glutes. And the great thing about the RDL is you can essentially alter which 
muscles you're biasing more so which muscles you're placing great emphasis on be that the hamstrings or the glutes based on knee flexion so essentially how bent your knees are but a lot of people forget that it's a hip hinge movement and we're going to go through that now we're hinging back hinging at the hips hinging at the hips hinging at the hips here the hips stop hinging now but she's just going down with it. The hip hinge is essentially where your hamstrings and your glutes are really thriving. That's what they're, they're there to do sort of thing. A few weeks ago, I did a video on Grow With Joe and one of her videos in which she promoted getting your bum to the wall behind you for the RDL on the hip hinge was featured. Great tip. So the big thing to remember is when you are doing an RDL, hinge at the hips, hinge at the hips, hinge at the hips. Once you can no longer hinge at the hips and you're still going further down, your hamstrings and glutes aren't really doing too much there. That's your lower back getting involved. So ultimately your lower back is probably working more than it should in this movement because your range of motion is likely excessive, i.e. you're going too low, as Caroline is here, and you are no longer hingy at the hips to achieve that range of motion. So again, if we look at it, hinging back, hinging back, hinging back, the hinge stops, and to get lower, it goes straight down. The hips are no longer going back. As soon as you can no longer hinge at the hips and your hips are no longer going back, that's when your RDL should be done for most people, provided you are looking at placing the majority of the emphasis and bias on the hamstrings or glutes. For me personally, that range of motion stops just below my knee, so very top of the shin. But again, that may be very much depend on you, your flexibility allowances, things along those lines. But the big thing is, kick your hips back. When your hips can't go any further back, that's your range of motion done. So we're gonna look at some staggered stance squats. So people often do stagger stance squats or like stagger stance movements to place great emphasis on one of the sides and then obviously swap sides, do the same for the other side. That's one of many reasons as to why they do them. I'm not a huge fan of stagger stance movements, although I'm sure they have a time and a place for some people. Just for me and myself, I rarely include them in my programming. And the main reason behind that is because I would prefer when looking at placing great emphasis on one side over the other, I would rather just do a standard unilateral movement. So instead of a staggered stance squat, I may do a heel elevated split squat. So I'm still getting plenty of knee flexion for the quads, but I'm also getting the glutes in there, working unilaterally as well, ticking the boxes I want to tick. But at the end of the day, if you can justify why you're doing this movement, I'm not saying it's a bad movement whatsoever, I'm not saying don't do stagger stance movements, I'm saying for me personally and for my training, there's not much of a place for them, but if you can justify why you're doing them, then sure, go for it. The big thing to remember is for most of these stagger stance movements, the majority of the weight in the force should be put through the front leg, which is often the working leg. But that's the same like a split squat, like 90 to 95% of your weight should probably be going through your front leg, which is the working leg. So now we've got a, a half rep motion. This is a partial rep movement so we're doing half rep stagger stance rdls personally i'm not a massive fan of doing half rep movements i think in not in all cases but in a lot of cases you should focus on taking that muscle or the muscles you're looking to work through a full range of motion and granted different movements are going to place greater emphasis on certain portions of the reps and certain positions of the muscles so when you're doing the rdl you obviously get that real nasty stretch the good stretch we like that that's because the rdl very much works the hamstrings in a lengthened position. Whereas something like a lying leg curl very much works the hamstrings in a shortened position. So the kind of majority of the tension and resistance is coming through at the shortened position when they've fully contracted. And that's a real hard bit sort of thing. Regardless of whether you're looking at burning calories, building muscle, whatever it may be, I would personally opt for a full range of motion. So coming the whole way up. Let's talk about Caroline's squat. Weights in front of obviously anterior loading there because again, at home, you are a bit limited to options, fair enough. Let's have a look at that depth. Depth is good, really good depth, I like that. So what I would do in Caroline's case, I think it's a pretty solid squat actually. What you could maybe consider doing is maybe turning the feet out a little bit more. And again, remember we spoke about the big toe, little toe heel, that triangle of pressure. So the weight is evenly distributed across the feet. And what I then like to do is spread the floor. So you see where Caroline's feet are now, Imagine your feet are there, just try and spread the floor. Like you're almost literally trying to separate it. That can help a lot with things like guiding your knee travel, things along those lines. And I think it's a really good cue to help a bit of external rotation at the hip, just to keep everything locked in and moving how it should move. And again, I think that tip becomes almost more useful when the weight gets heavier and you find it harder to maintain consistent technique. So as you get stronger and stronger, you lift more and more weight. Eventually you start noticing things where your knees, knees might be cavy excessively, things along those lines. But that's when you can really focus on spreading the floor to prevent any excessive knee cave from occurring. Just a tip that might help you at home if you are struggling with your knees caving during squats. The epic finisher. And this is the, the, the kind of main topic of the video and the main thing I want to cover today. Because when this video was sent to me by a few people, each of them said the same thing, saying, Harry, during Caroline's finisher, 
She focuses on doing a 100 rep set. What are your thoughts on this? As you'll see, every time you do a squat, it's one rep. 25 reps one side, then you switch. She's obviously been watching all the TFNL videos there with the U versus you, I'm just saying. So let's look at it from different angles. First of all, we're gonna look at it from the angle of hypertrophy and muscle building. 100 reps in a set. So that is very much what I would deem to be like excessive and potentially junk volume. And the reason why I say this is because we know the hypertrophy rep range or the rep range most aligned with hypertrophy is between five and 30 reps. So when looking at hypertrophy and building muscle, I would probably wouldn't go below five reps, nor would I go above 30 reps. So that's one thing to consider. So, so for muscle building, this rep range is, is not really it, I would say. I, I personally wouldn't do it. But then we look at caloric expenditure. Maybe that's another avenue to approach it from. Sure, if you do a lot of reps, you are going to burn more calories. So if you burn X amount of calories moving 10 times, you're probably going to burn more calories moving 100 times. The thing with 100 rep anything, it will yield a mass amount of burning. It will yield a mass amount of hurting. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's effective, nor does it mean you should do it. I think for most people, I don't think 100 reps on anything is really necessary. And you've got to ask yourself, why are you doing this workout? Are you doing this workout primarily for building muscle? Then I'd say I wouldn't even pursue the 100 reps on anything. If you're doing this workout primarily for calorie expenditure, Sure, it has more of a place. It makes a bit more sense because obviously more movement. You have to do 100 reps. No, I'm just saying it makes more sense. If you were to approach this workout with the goal of kind of just staying fit, doing more, moving more, things along those lines. Sure, again, are you moving more, doing 100 reps than if you were doing nothing? Absolutely. Sure, that could be a justification, then go for it. Are you maybe doing this because you want fun? If you enjoy this, I'm going to be honest with you, if you enjoy doing 100 reps of anything, then I think we need to talk because there's a problem there. But if you do enjoy it for whatever reason that may be, then sure, do it. If you can't justify what you're doing, then you probably shouldn't do it. But if you can justify why you're doing 100 reps, then sure. Go for it. Again, not saying this workout's bad or anything along those lines. The Caroline Notoriety does produce pretty solid workouts. I'm deliberately not assessing the quality of this whole workout because it is 47 minutes long. I don't think you want to listen to me waffle for an hour, but I thought this video would be a great opportunity to talk about what jump volume actually is, which is essentially unnecessary volume on anything. Let's say you're building muscle. Again, volume only takes you so far. Intensity takes you the rest of the way. You could do 100 sets in a workout, but if your intensity is, is not really there, then your results are, are not really going to be there either. You could do 10 sets in the workout, but if your intensity really is there, your results are probably going to be there too. You can only respond to so much volume. So if, let's say you could respond to 15 sets in the workout. I'm not saying you will, but let's say you could only respond to 15 sets. Sure, you could do 25 sets in the workout. That additional volume you're getting is not necessarily yielding better results. Don't do too much. Don't feel guilty if you feel like you haven't done enough. Quality over quantity. Movement execution, so make sure your movements are top tier. You're doing them well, you're doing them right. Intensity, regardless of goals, Make sure you're training hard and enjoyment. Whatever you're doing, you've got to enjoy it because if you don't enjoy it, you won't stick to it. If you don't stick to it, it's probably not the best workout for you. So I'm not saying I'm disappointed with Caroline for including this because I feel like realistic with home workouts, people aren't just looking at building muscle. They aren't just looking at calorie expenditure. They're looking at other goals. They have many goals, maybe even multiple goals. I think when you're limited to equipment where you've only got some dumbbells and your body to keep things fun, exciting and fresh, you do have to do things that are a bit different. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's actually optimal because optimal training is notoriously boring to be honest that being said training doesn't have to be optimal training has to be sustainable training has to help you achieve your goals and training has to be enjoyable but those are just my thoughts and opinions as you know as a whole i'm quite a fan of caroline and her workouts in the grand scheme of things as i've expressed many times before and again i do understand why she is doing this but now we're going to crack on with comment question of the week and no surprise it's a good one because it's come from moose who uh, who's known for asking bloody good questions if I do say so. What is your preferred method of mental health care or development? I think ultimately you go on to speak about meditation, how meditation can be in different forms. Like for example, you spoke about how you're finding value in just simply existing, which I think is, is bloody splendid. I guess you could technically consider my preferred method a means of meditation. And to me, I almost see training as meditation. And that's kind of like my big focus of mental health care. I love going to the gym because I want to get bigger, I want to get stronger, I want to do all those things. But I also love going to the gym because that environment alone makes me feel better. Training and doing something that I'm actively working hard at, which I know will yield results, almost removes the uncertainty of life and how I'm feeling and gives me a lot of control. And that's the big thing that helps me when I'm struggling is being in control of something. And like I said, training is one of the few aspects of your life in which you can directly control the progress you make. If you can call training, meditation i would deem that to be my personal preference when it comes to mental health care but yeah i love to i love to hear your thoughts down below what's your preferred method of mental health care and development but that is it 
that is a video. If you like the video, please let me know you like the video by dropping a like on the video. 1200 likes is a goal in the first 24 hours, so if we could reach that, that'd be bloody stupendous. If you haven't already, please do consider clicking the red button down below and subscribing to the channel, and maybe even the bell next to it so you get notified when I upload every week, twice a week. And if you too have a question you want me to answer at the end of the next video, drop it down below for comment question of the week, and I shall do so. Thank you for tolerating me. Thank you for tolerating my probably incorrectly worn hat and missing half of my face. And thank you for tolerating the video.